So for this discussion, we'll be talking about the presidency, uh, the executive branch is the head uh, of that branch, and how the president uh, can, what the qualifications are to become president, uh, how long they maintain it, uh, what powers they have, what roles um, and responsibilities they have, as well as how the departments underneath them uh, work and, and, and the roles they have in those departments. After we talk about this one, uh, the next part on the executive branch will be about um, pretty much how the president's elected and the role of the primary uh, elections, uh, the uh, national conventions, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, electoral college, how it, how it works um, down to a T, and then um, kind of how things have evolved recently uh, regarding the uh, role of those elections and, and funding and coverage and things like that. So today it's all about the uh, pr uh, actions and responsibilities and powers, and then tomorrow's gonna be more about um, how they become elected and chosen. So, um, Article Two of the U.S. Constitution uh, deals with the executive branch. It lays out, you know, gives provides the basic structure, which is open for um, interpretation uh, according to the Supreme Court. And they've made decisions, not quite as many, uh, at least notable ones, as has been with Congress over the years. Uh, but there are some contentious points in here. So. We'll start first with what's called uh, the vesting clause. Uh, vesting as in like uh, you're cloaked in or, or granted, you're wearing or wielding, uh, in this case, uh, certain powers. Uh, and the power that the president is uh, vested with is gonna be, of course, the executive branch uh, and that role of uh, executing or enforcing laws and uh, policies that are already in place. All right, so, um, the uh, president serves uh, as the chief executive slash head of state. And it's obviously currently the most powerful position in the world, certainly. Um, and uh, in any country, really, it's going to be that executive position. Obviously, it can vary how much power they have, but generally speaking, that's going to be a particularly important one because they're the ones that can actually make things happen. Physically, like, for example, Congress makes uh, and passes budgets and bills and laws and resolutions. Right? So they, they make the decisions. They say, this is what we're going to do, and this is how much money we're going to do it with. Uh, but the president uh, or the executive branch is the one that actually takes those uh, and actually acts them out in the world, makes sure they actually happen. So the, the president kind of doesn't act unless he's got something um, to do or enforce. Uh, whether it's provided directly to uh, him or her by the, the Constitution itself, or it's um, a, a directive from Congress through re legislation. But that's what their role is. They're the ones that can actually go out there and <clears throat> make uh, change organizations, not change organizations, but establish organizations and uh, administer them. Uh, so the ones that actually carry the law out uh, and carry out the policies and maintain them. And the Supreme Court is that third separate branch, which after decisions have been made and budgets passed by the Congress, and after the, the executive branch, whether it's the president or, or uh, some sub-branch of that, uh, carries them out, the Supreme Court can, uh, if it's brought their, to their attention, uh, decide what the uh, interpretation of that is relating regarding the U.S. Constitution. Like, was this constitutional or not? Uh, but again, it has to be brought to them. So that's kind of what those three do. So you got Congress, they're the ones that produce the uh, budgets and laws and decisions and say, we're gonna do this or approve this treaty or whatever it might be. Then the president and, and the people underneath uh, him or her are gonna be the ones that take those laws and directives and treaties, et cetera, and actually act them out and enforce them uh, in the world. And then thirdly, you've got, of course, the uh, judicial branch that uh, doesn't actively do anything uh, they wait until something has already occurred and an issue is brought to their attention uh, by uh, an, a member of the government or a citizen or a, a lower court, well, it's always lower court, but, uh, or, or a state, whatever it might be, or local government, uh, they wait for the issue to come to them and they decide if that action uh, by the executive branch or that legislation or resolution by the uh, Congress was or wasn't constitutional. So we'll start with qualifications. You gotta be at least 35 years old, got to be a natural born citizen, uh, meaning you can't have uh, been born, uh, you can't be a foreign national for another country and obtain citizenship here and run for president. You can still go to Congress, run for Congress after seven to nine years in the 
House and the Senate. Uh, but for the presidency, since it's a single person that heads it, uh, and uh, you have a lot more actual uh, power to, to, to take action as president, then they would much rather you be solely uh, loyal to uh, your natural born uh, states. I guess that's what, they, what their hope is anyway, uh, by requiring this. So 35, natural born citizen, and then you have to be a uh, 14 uh, year inhabitant. So with, for 14 years, I should rephrase that, inhabitant for 14 years. So you have to have lived here for at least 14 years. Uh, and the reason, um, not the reason, how that would play out is, let's say, for example, you were born here, natural born citizen. Uh, you're zero, obviously. You go all the way up to age five, uh, and then your parents move to Germany, and you stay there until uh, for 25 years. So you come back to the United States at age 30. Yay, you, natural born citizen. Uh, you're 30, you're almost there. Five years go by, you're like, I'm gonna run for president. Actually, you cannot. Uh, aside from the fact that they probably wouldn't vote for you because 35 is pretty damn young uh, for a president. You hadn't been an inhabitant of the United States uh, up to that point for 14 years. You had from zero to five been, then your parents moved to Germany and come back till for 25 years, so you're 30. Uh, so even though you are 30 and by the time you're 35, uh, you've reached that age, you've only actually been an inhabitant of the United States for 10 years, you have to wait another four. Uh, that's what that requirement is essentially all about. Um, so those are the qualifications. And um, if you are elected, and we'll, we'll talk about the, the process of uh, primary elections and caucus elections and the national convention and political parties and the electoral college and all those details. Um, we do know, of course, what the electoral, electoral college is from previous lectures, but the next one will go more in depth on how it actually plays out. Uh, and what's going on here currently in 2020 anyway, uh, as far as uh, the presidential race. So if you are elected though, uh, the term limit is, or sorry, not the term limit, the uh, time limit per term is four years. So once you're elected, you, you're a president for four years and then uh, you would have to potentially uh, run for election again. And while there origi originally was not a cap on how many times you could be elected, although uh, George Washington sort of set the precedent at doing it twice and then calling it quits, uh, four years uh, per term, they've actually changed this since the, uh, um, uh, the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the uh, 30s and 40s, uh, who ran four consecutive terms, and when I think he died in, in his fourth, uh, he went four consecutive terms, and afterwards they realized having a president consistently, or constantly just win election uh, after election isn't that much different from having a, a type of monarch. So uh, afterwards, they're going to pass the 22nd Amendment, not sure what year that was exactly. Was it 67? Might not have been 67, so don't quote me. No, that was the 25th Amendment. So the 22nd Amendment, nonetheless, after FDR, um, uh, they're going to cap the amount of times you can become president uh, at two terms. So you uh, get elected the first time, you run four years, you could be reelected again. Yay you, uh, but after your second term, you're no longer permitted to uh, run for president. So that happened to Clinton uh, from uh, 92 to, to 2000, and then Bush from 2000 to 2008, then uh, for um, uh, Obama uh, from 2008 to 2016. Um, but they do uh, give you kind of a little bit, at least a half term um, more, if let's say you were a vice president and the president uh, died or, or was impeached or whatever, uh, so long as you're not doing more than half the term, uh, they won't count it against you. So it's either two terms, uh, or 10 years. So potentially you could serve less than half a term as president, uh, as a vice president, um, and then of course two of your own terms uh, being elected. That's actually a pretty smart addition because then potentially you could uh, just uh, run indirectly for president as vice president uh, if your party or country really liked you, uh, and then just have the president step down every time and you could just keep being president to the vice presidency. So uh, good idea there uh, by Congress to, to cap that. Um, that's, uh, of course, the qualifications and terms. So when they are elected into office, uh, they first have to have their ceremony and then they have to swear the uh, oath of office. That's actually a stipulation in the US Constitution, oath of office. And uh, that's one where uh, the wording sort of changed uh, over the years, but they've included uh, before God to it. Um, 
or so, God, so help me to it, or so help me God, there we go, so help me God to that. Um, they've added um, saying your name instead of just I. Uh, they say I, you know, George Washington, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but this uh, oath of office is given by the uh, Chief Justice Supreme Court. Just go with this Chief Justice. And um, this will be relevant later. Part of the oath is that you are swearing um, to uh, use your powers as president uh, to preserve and protect uh, the U.S. Constitution. That's the uh, part of it. And there have been presidents that have cited this part of the oath as a reason for acting or not acting uh, in certain ways or on certain occasions uh, in an attempt to what they see, uh, what they perceive as upholding the U.S. Constitution. So they'll do something or they'll refuse to do something that they see as unconstitutional based on this oath. Uh, I'll talk about that briefly here uh, when we get to uh, the next section on um, the powers. Let's quickly go over. Um, more about holding the actual office. So qualifications, term limits, you've got to take the oath. Um, so the question becomes also, what if in these terms you are, um, uh, the president dies, or they become incapacitated somehow, whether they uh, you know, become uh, too ill to serve, or incapacitated in some way, uh, or they resign, or they uh, are impeached, uh, what exactly goes on if the vice president takes over. And the reason why we asked that is the first time that it did happen, in 1841, I think, what was his name? John Tyler took over when William Henry Harrison died of typhoid fever. If I'm remembering that wrong, sorry. Uh, but it was 19th century. And the question was, when the vice president took over, um, does he become the president for the rest of the term? Because I think Harrison died like almost immediately. So it's like, does this guy, uh, John Tyler, is he now the president all the way till the term's over? Or is he serving as president until we elect a new one? Like, uh, do we start up another election right away and pick a new one and he's just the temporary fill-in? Or is he just the president all the way through the end of the term? Uh, and that's been interpreted specifically after the uh, 25th Amendment because there were that and several other issues too. Okay, hiccups. All right. So, um, issues with replacing uh, the, the 25th Amendment, which, which I'll get to in a second. But I guess first I should mention the uh, uh, line of secession. No, we'll talk about the, the vice president taking over because it's kind of implied. So uh, VP uh, taking over in president's absence. And again, that could mean death, resignation, impeachment, or being incapacitated from uh, surgery or, or some sort of sickness, whatever it might be. In present absence. That was established specifically by the 25th uh, Amendment to the U.S. Constitution uh, in 1967. I'm pretty sure 67. And that makes, that uh, places four stipulations on uh, this VP taking over. So first of all, it settles the issue of, is the vice president just filling in until we elect a new one quickly? Or is he going to be acting president or she acting president all the way through the end of the term? Uh, and the answer to that is, VP uh, becomes uh, president for the remainder of term. So that settles that question. Uh, and the only issue becomes, uh, is it going to be more than two years or not, if he's going to try to run again twice or just once. Um, also, the VP is going to um, uh, nominate a, or sorry, new president, I should say, new president is going to nominate a new vice president. So they're just going to fill that vice president void again in case uh, this new president uh, resigns, gets impeached, dies, or becomes incapacitated as well. Uh, and this new VP, since it wasn't voted on uh, through the Electoral College like the vice president and president are, uh, that is going to be determined by Congress. Just a simple majority vote uh, is going to determine that one. Uh, Congress majority approval. The third part of this is uh, specific, and it's actually been used a few times, or cited a few times, uh, when the president is knowingly going to be incapacitated uh, for a set amount of time. Uh, so like, for example, I know a couple times like Reagan and, and, and Bush and Obama and others, or I don't know if Obama did, but I know Bush did and Reagan did, that when they were going to have surgery, 
uh, or, or some sort of routine checkup like a colonoscopy, which does incapacitate you for a while. Uh, they can't actually act as president because they could, uh, in the delirium of the uh, narcotics used to uh, anesthetize them or, or, or whatever, they could, you know, <laughs> make these awful decisions, uh, and start a war, things like that, uh, or they would not be able to respond to immediate threats. So they gave them sort of the power uh, to assign the vice president the power of the presidency, but not become the president temporarily. Um, and then once the president is ready to resume power again, they can uh, issue a written statement. So, uh, and they both had to be official written statements uh, to Congress, I believe. So the president can, uh, uh, not attribute, grant, there we go, grant VP presidential powers uh, and return them in uh, writing. And again, that's been used a couple times for uh, a few hours at least when um, various presidents have undergone surgery or, or, or operations where they're uh, not able to or even conscious uh, to respond to threats uh, or they could potentially uh, do something that would be, be harmful to the nation. Um, and fourthly, so President can grant, they added a, an interesting portion to this amendment that hasn't been used yet so far as I know. Uh, and that's where the vice president can temporarily I don't say temporarily, can uh, take power from the president if they are unable to perform their duties. So let's say that they're potentially being tyrannical uh, or they have uh, uh, succumbed to some sort of uh, psychological illness or whatever it might be. Uh, if the president is not able to perform their job uh, in the uh, perspective uh, or in the eyes of the vice president, the vice president with a majority of the president's uh, staff, the cabinet, which we'll get to here in a second, uh, can uh, take presidential powers temporarily. And uh, that, of course, is going to be reviewed by Congress. Uh, and if a two-thirds vote of Congress uh, returns that to the president, then it's got to go back. Uh, otherwise, they can approve it, and the president can be out of power indefinitely. Uh, potentially for the remainder of the term or just till they figure out what the problem is or whatever. Uh, but that's an interesting addition that hasn't been played out. And again, that, that would be helpful if, say, I don't know, I'm going to make something up. Like, let's say the president randomly developed a brain tumor they didn't know about uh, and was not able to perform his duties because it was, uh, or her duties because they uh, were experiencing some sort of cognitive uh, difficulties or, or blocks. They might be able to take action um, to... Uh, uh, to, to take the executive powers and then have Congress assess if that was going to be uh, legitimate or not. All right, so that's basically qualifications and, and term and uh, oath and, and of course how the, uh, the vice president can uh, take over for the president in, in different scenarios. Um, but just in case, for example, uh, the president were to be uh, removed or, or killed or whatever and the VP did immediately after or quickly after, there is a line of secession going down uh, quite a ways. This has flip-flopped a few times in U.S. history in the 19th and 20th centuries, but as of the last flop uh, back, I think it was 1947, uh, as per Harry Truman, suggestion in, in Congress passed this, um, there is a, a secession uh, sequence. I don't know if it's called the Secession Act. It might be, uh, but there is there are rules uh, for secession. I should say a specific line. So again, it could happen that the president and vice president are both uh, killed or incapacitated within a short amount of time. So the question then becomes, who's the chief executive uh, for the United States? They actually made uh, a designated list. So one of the flip-flops was they made it go to the president's executive advisors, the ones that he or she appoints. Uh, and Truman and Congress didn't like the idea of uh, people the president shows becoming president potentially in this line of secession. They would much rather have it go to an elected official. Uh, and then, you know, um, once those elected officials are out of the way, if they all got knocked out somehow, then you would start going down the executive appointed uh, cabinet mem members. So it first starts with, so obviously first you got uh, the, the president, uh, him or herself, then the vice president. But if those two were taken out or incapacitated, it would then go to the speaker of the house because again, that's an elected official, so Congress and Truman liked that idea better than presidential appointments. 
Uh, and then fourth would be the president for temp or the uh, Senate to board the Senate. All those are elected officials. Uh, and then once the, those first four, if that had ever happened, which it's highly improbable that ever would happen, uh, then you would start going down cabinet members, start with the Secretary of State, uh, the Secretary of Defense. I can't remember the exact order, but that's when you start going down the, um, uh, the cabinet members, the advisors, those ones that the uh, uh, president appointed, and then of course the, the Senate um, are gonna confirm, or the president chose, and then the, the, the Senate appoints and confirms. So that's the uh, line of secession uh, as of 1947. Actually, I should keep this here, uh, cabinet members. And there is a, a, an order, you don't need to know it. Uh, just know that the elected officials come first as the head of the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, and then um, then you start going uh, through cabinet members. All right, so those are the qualifications and term limits and all that in the uh, uh, order of secession. So let's now start going over the powers uh, that the president has according to the U.S. Constitution uh, and some of those responsibilities as well. So, as you may recall from our discussions earlier, the um, president, uh, he or her uh, self, they have the obligation to faithfully uh, execute the laws of the United States and, and maintain um, the departments and administrations uh, that carry those things out. Uh, so this is going to conflict with something. So this is, I think it's from section of article to article to section three, clause five. The clause might be wrong. Nonetheless, it's in the Constitution that the president has to faithfully execute uh, the uh, laws, execute and enforce. What does that mean? That means that even if the president disagrees with a particular law or policy, they're still obligated by their constitutional duties uh, to carry that out, right? So this essentially means uh, must execute laws even if uh, they disagree with them. Oops. So let's say a president comes into power and doesn't like a particular immigration policy, they still have to enforce it, right? They have to put and establish a secretary of state and other ministers that will carry it out. And even if they find it distasteful or wrong, uh, they're gonna have to actually uh, recognize it and enforce it. Um, they can, of course, try to suggest things to Congress and, and, and make other changes, but it's their obligation to actually enforce it. If they're not, that's when you can look at possible repercussions, maybe even impeachment, uh, depending on what they are or aren't doing. So that's kind of straightforward, but where it's not straightforward, and it's been argued at times uh, in history, is when they take that oath of office that I mentioned earlier that says they will do anything to preserve and protect the US Constitution, there's kind of a conflict here, because it says you have to execute the law faithfully, even if you disagree with it, uh, but then you're also supposed to protect and preserve the US Constitution. Um, the issue has been, and it's been cited by several presidents in the past, that uh, if there's something that I have to do, or I, or I, uh, you know, I should do, that is constitutional, I need to do it, even if I'm not supposed to. Let's, so let's say Congress says, um, well, we'll use the quarantine thing as an example. It's going on right now in 2020. Um, let's say Congress said uh, all people everywhere, this hasn't happened obviously, but all people everywhere, regardless of your job, you have to stay home, uh, and if you go outside at all, uh, you could be arrested and imprisoned for that, right? So obviously law enforcement have to be out to some degree, but everybody else has to stay home. Um, the president, which right now is Donald Trump, would have to, according to this clause, faithfully execute that, even if he disagreed with it, but um, he might try to argue that his oath, which says that you're supposed to do everything in your power to preserve and protect the U.S. Constitution, says that's unconstitutional, take people's rights away like that, uh, so I won't do it. So there'd be that, that issue, and of course that would go to court, uh, and the Supreme Court would, would rule whether or not uh, they could or couldn't do that. In that case, they would almost certainly say uh, uh, Congress's legislation uh, is unconstitutional, but um, that's sort of the, the struggle that presidents have had to go through at times in history. So this can conflict, conflict at times with oath of uh, office. Again, they're supposed to preserve and protect the U.S. Constitution. So just a couple examples. 
um, uh, President uh, Andrew Jackson, when he uh, vetoed the bill for the uh, second uh, national bank, uh, he cited this as his reasoning. He's not going to, he's of course, shoot down or not do anything or take any action he can to preserve the Constitution. And he felt that the, uh, uh, the central banking system was a, uh, a breach of the Constitution, which of course, it's been interpreted since as not being. Um, Lincoln himself was, I actually got a Lincoln credit, um, because in this one, maybe not as much, but he was formerly a lawyer, and he was really good at finding these nice little legal loopholes uh, to uh, justify, not even justify, uh, to uh, legitimize his actions. Um, he suspended the right to trial um, during uh, a time of war, because the president does not actually have authority to uh, act with martial law. If there's a state of emergency, uh, the president can act um, as, as sort of a, kind of like how, how, how Rome did with the dictator, like the, uh, the Senate's power would go to one single person in time of an emergency. Um, you can sort of claim emergency powers too as the president and, and do certain things. And in this case, he imprisoned certain members of, I think it was Baltimore, uh, without a trial because at that time, it was very unclear which states were or weren't seceding from the Union. Uh, and he, in, an order, in an effort to maintain law and order and preserve the Union uh, in a state of emergency, uh, he believed he had the right to uh, imprison these people without a trial. And when the court system, the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that, he just ignored them and cited this uh, oath as the reason for why he was doing that. Um, another one, too, is Andrew Johnson after Lincoln when the Congress passed these Reconstruction Amendments that, um, or, or acts that uh, attempted to do several things that were considered unconstitutional uh, to the Southern states who were returning to the Union. Uh, he refused to act on them and uh, cited this uh, uh, oath as the reason for that, that it was to him unconstitutional. Um, so there's that conflict where they have to execute the laws if they don't agree, but then again, they also have to uphold the Constitution. So you've had that, that, that tension before at times in history. All right, that's probably more information than you need on that. Um, despite any personal objections they might have or issues, they are, of course, intended to carry things out because that's what the executive branch does. Um, so as the chief executive, they are expected to carry out uh, initiatives of Congress uh, or their uh, constitutional duties. So these uh, actions, which are called executive orders, they can't be like new laws in, them, in and of themselves. They are intended only for uh, carrying out their constitutional duties of executing, enforcing, and administering the laws uh, of the land uh, or, or the uh, uh, bureaus uh, of that land, of the land. Um, those can be uh, expressly connected to or granted from Congress for carrying out legislation or, or constitutional duties, uh, or they can be implied. But they can't just be brand new laws. Like the president can't just sit there and sign executive orders uh, and make up new laws. That would be unconstitutional. Uh, it has to be some form of policy or decision or order, hence the, the name executive order, uh, that is in line with their constitutional duties uh, or legislation coming out of Congress. So that's what we know as an executive order. Not the same thing as a law, not a law per se, uh, but an order to enforce uh, Congress legislation uh, or, a, or a constitutional duty. Uh, so pretty much anything that has to do with uh, um, carrying out military uh, duties or objectives, because that's the power we haven't gotten to yet, the, the president's the, the, the chief uh, commander-in-chief of the military. Uh, if it's related to the military, uh, executive orders are for carrying out military objectives uh, or military procedures whatever, or administrations, whatever it might be. So you could potentially violate the Constitution based on the executive order, but the, the president passing or issuing these executive orders for the military is not in and of itself in con unconstitutional. Um, also, too, if, if Congress, uh, I don't know, releases some form of legislation uh, about, uh, uh, you know, some like nationwide quarantine, uh, an executive order enforcing that, like empowering police to do this or not to do this, whatever it might be, uh, 
uh, or requiring citizens to do this, not do that, uh, to, to align with the, that piece of legislation by Congress, those would be uh, valid uses of an executive order. Um, but these have been controversial. Uh, like I so said, they were they were only recently named in the 20th century, uh, and they, they kind of backtracked and logged what they believed were executive orders. Uh, but there have been some controversial ones uh, over time. But, but real quick, I'm going to say one more thing. They're not primary legislation in that they're making new laws like, like Congress does. Uh, they're actually kind of a, what you might even call a secondary uh, legislation uh, uh, or uh, uh, what's the word we're looking for? Sta state statute. That means that they can only be used, uh, used to um, uh, enforce a primary legislation or uh, manage an executive department. Some examples of these executive orders that have been carried out, uh, some of these are pretty controversial. Um, one of the most famous ones, so here's some examples. One of the most famous ones was the Emancipation Proclamation. in 1863, and that was when, um, some people falsely think this was the end of slavery in the United States, it wasn't. Uh, this was the end of and confiscation of uh, slaves because they were considered property by the Confederate States and the president has the constitutional authority to seize the property of enemy states in a, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a uh, situation, a warlike situation or a state of war. So. That's exactly what Lincoln did. Uh, as he went into these uh, Confederate territories and there were slaves, he uh, uh, confiscated them as property uh, and then, of course, uh, released them as, as free people into uh, the actual Union or United States. So that's how that um, clever piece of legislation, executive order, uh, was constitutional, despite doing something you would think might be unconstitutional. Certainly morally uh, correct, but the ability to, to go in and, and the president, you know, uh, say something is or isn't okay, that's generally a court thing or a, a, a primary legislation from Congress that would do that. He usually has to enforce it, but he did use this little caveat, this little loophole, uh, because the Confederates considered them property, uh, he could confiscate enemy property in a time of war, so he, he went ahead and did that. Um, another one, um, a controversial one, was um, Executive Order 6102, I think? It's the one where they seized gold, essentially. The number might be wrong, but it's, what, it's a seizure of gold. It's in 1933, it's under FDR. Uh, and during the Great Depression, yeah, 6102, I think. Uh, during the Great Depression, they were running low on gold reserves, because back when we had the gold standard. And they required everybody to sell their gold uh, to the uh, Treasury Department, or by a certain point in time, or it could be confiscated uh, by force uh, by the U.S. government. So that was an executive order, and um, I'm not sure if that was up upheld or not. It doesn't seem like it would be. Um, the courts were pretty friendly to FDR, though, during that period, so it was Congress. But I don't know if they actually shot that down. I forget if they shot that down as being constitutional or not, uh, because technically you could interpret it as carrying out Congress's implied power of maintaining a stable economy and that the president helps do that like for example they they had the department of treasury which handles like the irs and things like that collect taxes so technically if you're talking about a constitutional provision of uh, the congress and then that is uh given to the executive branch in this case where you actually go out and collect the taxes and and, and maintain uh, the economy that, that could technically be seen as a power. I don't know what the courts actually ruled on that, ruled on that, but that was definitely a controversial one, which forced you to sell the government your gold uh, or have it taken from you. Um, another one is um, what was the number of it? Executive Order eight eight oh seven. That was one where uh, this is in a time of war. This is FDR as well, where he developed and funded a new department in the military. Uh, for uh, enhancing the Manhattan Project, which in case you guys don't know, was in 1941 when they started uh, researching the atomic bomb uh, as a sort of like nuclear arms race when they heard the uh, Nazis had a program. Uh, so that was the uh, Manhattan Project uh, Research Department. I don't remember the name of the department. 
but that was one that was uh, under the authority of the um, executive because they're they're the head of the military, and that of course is a very military research uh, based uh, objective, and um, uh, that that would be that would fall under at least initially fall under the authority of the uh, uh, executive branch and the president. Uh, the next one was one that was initially upheld, but then of course now we. Uh, agree it was not constitutional. Executive Order 9066, and that one is the infamous, this is also FDR, um, internment of Japanese Americans, where when we uh, went to war with uh, Japan after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, President um, uh, FDR passed Executive Order 9066, which uh, forced all Japanese Americans to uh, uh, concentration camps, essentially these internment camps, on um, the west coast of the United States. Uh, and they still have some of those up here. Uh, in fact, there's just one a few miles away up by Stockton, uh, or at least a, a museum and, and, and relic of it, uh, of these Japanese internment camps. Uh, the Supreme Court actually upheld that in, I think it was 44, the Court of Monsters of the United States, uh, when one of the uh, Japanese courts protested this as a violation of their rights, which it certainly was. Um, and uh, in, at the time, they ruled uh, against Korematsu, but of course now the U.S. has admitted that was a uh, civil rights violation. I, I believe they actually issued, I don't know how, how relevant it was, but I believe they issued in the 70s some sort of reparation for that uh, to those families, but and that was years later, uh, and they already suffered. Uh, and the last one, this one's a, a rather famous one and a very controversial one, Executive Order 10... 320, 340? The numbers might be off. I, I don't care if you remember the numbers or not. I just want you to know what, what happened, uh, maybe who. This was when President Truman, after World War II, I think it was 1952, um, he nationalized the steel mills. And you're like, okay, what does that mean? That means he took what were privately owned steel companies, right, by, by entrepreneurs that start up a business and maybe they're a corporation on the board, I don't know, all of them, but. During the Korean War, which is what was going on here, there was a strike uh, against private steel companies. These steel workers wanted, wanted more money, essentially. Um, and the government was requiring these steel companies to uh, uh, make steel for them for the war effort uh, in Korea. And they were coming up short. So these workers were upset with the pay and the steel mills were upset with having to uh, cater to the uh, US government, which was far less uh, profitable than the uh, civilian uh, private uh, uh, economy. And um, the workers would go on strike and the, uh, the steel companies were uh, hesitant and upset with this, uh, these quotas, uh, required quotas from the government. So uh, in face of a uh, severe steel shortage uh, in uh, the Korean War, if it was for only a few days, it would really, really, really harm the war effort. Um, Truman thought he had the authority to nationalize and just take these steel companies and all their materials and make them part of the government and use them for the war production. So he enacted it, but the Supreme Court is gonna shoot that one down uh, shortly after as being unconstitutional. While it is constitutional for the US to seize manufacturing production that is falling short of uh, military production, unless they have a, a, a direct, con a direct uh, connection to uh, or co contract with that company um, and it's not dependent upon a, a, a union or labor strike, they might have had the authority, but those those were not conditions that were there. Uh, so that was when Truman tried to, or did actually, uh, take the US steel mills and make them the governments, but then that was of course undone and handed back to the private companies afterwards. So those are executive orders, and, and these have been quite controversial over the years, uh, but they're not permanent. Um, or I shouldn't say they're not permanent, they are permanent, but they can be removed in, in a few different ways. So let's say they, they do something like what the Japanese internment camp, for example, uh, or the gold seizing or whatever it might be. One that's clearly unconstitutional or certainly seems unconstitutional. They can be undone. Um, Congress can undo them if it's uh, linked to a, an expressed or implied power from a piece of congressional legislation. But that's hard to do. So I'll say Congress can modify slash remove uh, if related to legislation, and they can't do it if it's linked to a um, uh, uh, part of the, the military, perhaps. It's not connected to congressional legislation anyway. They wouldn't have any authority, but like, let's say it is connected to some sort of 
congressional legislation in some way, they might be able to uh, go and modify or remove that executive order. But that's tough because they're going to have to uh, issue a resolution, which is like a, 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 a quick solution to an emergency or continuation of an existing bill. Um, but the president can veto that just like they can a regular bill. So they need two thirds of both uh, House of Congress to do that. So that's tough to do. So that one's rare. Two thirds uh, 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 Congress. So that makes it hard. Uh, another one that's possible is Supreme Court, uh, of course, can practice judicial review and, and turn it down. Uh, can remove. But that one can only occur after the uh, action has already been uh, put into action and somebody has uh, submitted a, uh, a case uh, to the lower courts and it's gone all the way up to the Supreme Court, which could take a while, uh, but it can happen. So if they are doing something unconstitutional, one can uh, file a grievance and um, uh, pursue a legal action to the courts uh, and the Supreme Court could review it, uh, but that's, that's an after the fact. Um, sort of deal, but it, but it does work and it is there nonetheless. Uh, and the president himself or herself can at any time modify or uh, um, remove an executive order at any time. Um, that doesn't just mean them, by the way, their executive orders. It could be previous presidents too. In fact, usually when a president takes office for the first time, uh, the first few weeks they review the executive orders of previous presidents and remove ones or modify ones that they don't like. Um, and they, they stay in effect until one of these three things happens. If the president modifies it or removes it, that was the easiest, quickest one. Congress does if it's connected to a piece of congressional legislation, but that requires a two-thirds majority because it's going to be vetoed, that resolution is going to be vetoed almost certainly by the president. Uh, and then the Supreme Court, uh, once it's already occurred and somebody uh, appeals it, they can uh, review it and, and shoot it down potentially. So those are executive orders and they are uh, an integral part of the executive branch. So again, don't think of them as primary legislation like laws that, that can um, affect change and, and change policies. Um, it's definitely a, a secondary statute in that it can only uh, be used to enhance a primary piece of legislation. Uh, or carry out a specifically designated role of the Constitution, uh, whether that is you know, related to the military or uh, the administration that carries things out uh, or whatever, uh, that's an executive order. However, it is all part, one part of what we call public policy formation. Public policy formation, reform, reforms public policy. All that means is public policy means you take something that's an ideal, like something we want to do politically. Uh, it's an idea uh, or a philosophy, whatever it might be, uh, some plan you have. Uh, and until it's actually put into effect, then it, that's all it is. It's just a plan. It's an idea. Uh, but public policy is when you take that idea and, and realize it and actually put it into practice. So executive orders are one way how the president can set public policy. Take ideas that are uh, inherent in the Constitution or of the time uh, or um, a part of legislation from Congress, uh, and they can carry out public policy, making those ideals uh, real uh, in the world. Um, not just the president does that, though. Uh, Congress also does that, can through uh, legislation, obviously. If they want some sort of health care reform, uh, they could um, affect public policy by making a new law or changing a law regarding uh, health care. Um, so Congress has a major impact on public policy, the ones that determine the laws and treaties and things like that. But also the Supreme Court can do that too with uh, decisions and precedents. Because they're the ones that um, you know, can potentially take an executive order or action or a piece of legislation, a, resolution, uh, a law or resolution and say, yeah, that's constitutional. No, that's not constitutional. Here's why. They're the ones that can set that precedent and determine public policy. Take the ideals of the Constitution and really interpret them and apply them uh, to the actual world. So that's definitely one form of public policy that the president has and can carry out uh, here in the world. So next we are going to talk then about the president's role as the head of the military, the commander in chief. All right, so the Constitution does also uh, expressly grant uh, the 
president as the sole head of the military, the commander in chief uh, of military. So president is commander in chief of uh, US military. And what I mean by that is uh, they are responsible for the defense of the nation and uh, um, the uh, administer or administration of uh, the armed forces. And again, those are those are uh, those are express powers. What they can't do is they can't make the decisions for how to use them. Well, actually, they can. We'll, we'll get to that. But it wasn't intended for that. So again, uh, keep in mind that the roles that the three branches have. The president's supposed to carry things out, right? Uh, they can't um, make new laws. They can only enforce the laws that are in play. Uh, so technically, if we're going to go to war, for example, and you guys know this from the legislative branch, uh, Article One portion, or you should anyway, uh, the only thing to declare war is Congress, right? Th that's due to the War Powers Clause. So if Congress declares war, the War Powers Clause. Um, but there are ways that the president can initiate that. We'll get to that in a second. Congress declares war, uh, president carries out the war, or at least organizes it, initiates it. Um, the president being the head of the military is very, very, very important, actually. Uh, historically, we know that if the military and the government are one, or the military is above the government, you just have a dictatorship. They're usually military juntas or military dictatorships that go by different names. Um, but uh, they are not generally very friendly uh, and very uh, oriented towards human rights and civil rights. They're generally pretty oppressive. So the framers, uh, and, and many governments have intended this, even communist governments uh, have intended this too. The president being the head and Congress being the one deciding when to, to, to use the military, hypothetically, uh, that's part of what we call a citizen-run uh, military. That is where, you, you of course have military professionals because nobody's gonna, there's no politicians that know how to actually go out and plan a battle and things like that, unless maybe they were in the military extensively. But they're the ones that decide what the military does. They say, okay, we're gonna go, this country's doing this, there's a genocide going on here, whatever, so we're gonna step in, or uh, they attack this country, so we're gonna step in, or uh, they're gonna invade us, or they might invade us, so we're gonna step in. So the, the politicians actually decide when the military does something, uh, and they actually have some say in what the military does, but the actual details of invasion and, and, and like, you know, uh, the logistics, those are generally left to the military professionals because that's what they do. Uh, but them actually taking action or not taking action, that's a, a decision not made by the military, it's made by the politicians that are publicly elected. So military decisions made by publicly elected officials. And that, of course, prevents a military dictatorship where if the military and the government are the same, if you don't listen, the military, uh, of course, is going to uh, punish you for that. Uh, that's why it's a really, really, really good idea to have a citizen-run military, because that way, even if we do get a tyrannical president who says, all right, um, these people are not listening, so go out and kill these people or imprison these people or whatever, people are not going to listen. Um, first of all, because Congress is going to have the authority to say no to that. But secondly, those who are raised in this military system will know not to obey some, uh, an order like that because it's blatantly against our Constitution and our civilian-run civilian, right, civilian run military. Uh, they're much more likely to hold back than if they, are, they see themselves as the supreme rulers of, of that nation. All right, so President Commander-in-Chief, uh, Congress uh, is technically the one that's supposed to declare war. This hasn't been quite so clear throughout history, though. Um, and when I say that, after World War II especially, there's been quite a few conflicts that the president has initiated without a declaration of war by Congress, which has made them a bit concerned. So here's a couple examples. Um, after World War II, I don't know what year that ended. That was 1945. I'll put the years that actually transpired. 1939 or 37, I guess you could say, if you're in Japan, China. 45, um, President has increasingly expanded 
um, uh, scope of military power. So again, it's supposed to be, as according to the War Powers Clause in the Constitution, Congress the one that declares war. However, several instances, the president got the United States into military action. Even if Congress agreed with it after the fact or even during, uh, the president did not necessarily get an approval or a formal declaration of war before initiating these things. So uh, one of the first examples was um, uh, Truman getting the United States involved, involvement in the Korean War. That was from 1950 to 53. Um, while Congress did support it, um, it was not, it was actually initiated uh, by Truman uh, in, in, and it's called actually a policing effort uh, as he was acting um, according to the United Nations that had, had just been formed. So it wasn't like, oh, we're not going to war, we're just policing the world with the UN. Uh, and again, while Congress did agree with it, Truman acted sort of a, uh, on his own authority uh, without waiting for a formal declaration of war uh, by Congress. Another example was Lyndon B. Johnson in the 1960s, actually even before him, Kennedy even. Uh, JFK, John F. Kennedy, uh, in, uh, with, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and again, Congress did support this, and actually Congress wanted to be a little more severe uh, initially. But when the Soviets were trying to install uh, nuclear missiles uh, in Cuba, who requested them because they thought the U.S. was going to invade them after the Bay of Pigs uh, uh, fiasco. Uh, so just in case you don't know, Cuba was run by Fidel Castro and his communist regime at 90 miles away from the United States. And um, the U.S. was trying to topple their regime, uh, and they feared an invasion by the U.S. So. They uh, want the Soviets, our, our arch nemesis at the time during the Cold War, uh, to install nuclear missiles there as a form of defense for them. The Soviets said, okay. They go to send them over. Um, Kennedy sort of withheld this information from Congress, which they did not like. Um, but eventually, uh, they were informed. I don't even know if Kennedy actually informed themselves they found out themselves. I forget the details on that. Nonetheless, uh, Kennedy sort of withheld the information and then uh, enacted or enabled a naval blockade that, that said they were going to stop the Soviet ships if they came near. Uh, and the Soviets said, if you do that, that's a, de that's a declaration of war. There was this huge standoff in the 60s where everyone was just gripped with this fear that World War III was going to start. Uh, and that would, of course, be a nuclear war uh, between the, the superpowers of the USSR and the, so and the uh, US, which would have been a disaster. But uh, Kennedy operated largely independently. And again, while Congress did agree with a stern response, and in fact, wanted a more stern response. Kennedy was sort of acting on his own uh, militaristically uh, in this um, uh, instance. Uh, you also had Lyndon B. Johnson in the Vietnam War. Uh, his entrance after the uh, Gulf of Tonkin incident when uh, North, uh, North Vietnamese boats fired upon U.S. vessels in the Tonkin Gulf. Uh, Johnson did get approval uh, through Congress uh, after the fact the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, but there was no formal declaration of war by Congress, um, and it wasn't entirely their decision to do that. In fact, Johnson had been inserting military personnel uh, as advisors into South Korea uh, previously, uh, and, and even JFK, I think, had as well. Regardless, uh, there was military involvement already, and Congress was very aware of that. But the, the kind of final straw was during the Vietnam War, U.S. President Nixon in the early 70s, uh, he started secretly bombing Cambodia, which was a country next to Vietnam that had a uh, communist supply trail in it um, to some extent. And Nixon began bombing uh, Cambodia, a neutral country, uh, without any consent or knowledge. He did it secretly, in fact. Uh, and Congress was so upset by this that, um, rightfully so, that they passed uh, what's called the War Powers Resolution. And here they sort of recognized that, 1973, they sort of recognized that, all right, fair enough. Um, there are instances where it takes too much time for the uh, Congress to make a decision on and declare war because they don't have the intelligence in front of them. Uh, the um, uh, information uh, regarding, you know, um, uh, that's what I'm looking for. The information regarding like uh, what's going on, and I mean intelligence not like as far as how smart they are. I mean like how much they know about what other countries are doing. So foreign intelligence, uh, intelligence agencies like the CIA and things like that. Um, the executive branch has that information. They don't, they're not just releasing it all uh, to Congress. Um, so 
they realize that Congress might not always know what's going on and when things need to happen. Uh, and so they kind of give the president this okay to do things initially, but then really, really quickly uh, inform Congress and ask for consent. So this War Powers Resolution says, no, president can't uh, uh, declare war, only we have the right to do that. But, uh, and in fact, he can still honor his uh, um, constitutional uh, rights uh, or, or powers by, of course, acting in the defense of the nation if we're attacked uh, or in the face of an immediate attack. But um, if he's going to take action, he or she's going to take action, they have to submit written consent or written uh, information uh, to Congress in 48 hours. So 48 hours. Forming of Congress officially, and they can uh, continue that activity while Congress gathers more information and makes a decision uh, for 60 days without approval. Now, if Congress does approve the actions, and they can extend the amount of time they use there that the military is active uh, or declare war themselves, whatever. But they have at least 60 days to continue activity before they have to be in withdrawing. And then after that 60 day point, they have a 30 day withdrawal period. So they basically have 90 days to get in and get out if Congress says no. Uh, if Congress says yes and uh, allows it to continue or declares war, then they're fine. But they got at least 90 days to, uh, uh, to get in and get out, essentially. Uh, that's pretty realistic. So this has been followed sometimes, but not consistently. So there's some question how effective this rule actually is in practice. Uh, so here's a couple examples. Um, Sometimes that was ignored, and here's a, a few instances of that. Uh, in um, 18, 1963, uh, Reagan um, ignored it in crap, what country was it? It wasn't Guatemala, was it? It was some Latin American country. Granada, there we go. Uh, Granada, uh, I think it was Granada. When he intervened um, without permission uh, due to uh, US intelligence reports, uh, of, of uh, communist activity there. You also had, um, in 1999, uh, President Bill Clinton um, approved and used the US military, along with NATO, the North uh, Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, uh, in bombing uh, Yugoslavia. The Serbians at the time were accused of, and they were, but not to the extent that they, they had originally thought, uh, committing genocide against some Muslim Albanians uh, in Kosovo. So, the, so NATO stepped in and uh, President Clinton authorized the use of the military and, and, and the Air Force uh, to conduct these bombings. And even though I think the Senate and the House were initially receptive of it, I don't know if the second resolution was receptive or not. I forget the exact details. Nonetheless, the issue was uh, he acted without the approval um, of Congress at the time, although they did get out by the time the 90-day period had ended. So that was, I guess, less controversial. Uh, and then in 2011, you had the uh, uh, US uh, intervention in Libya by Obama, which was also um, um, not, uh, did not obtain uh, the, the consent of Congress uh, at the time. And I believe they even illegally continued activity to some extent beyond that 90-day um, period. Uh, there were some examples, though, of it being followed, at least in, uh, in, in theory or in spirit. Um, in 1991, President Bush in the Persian Gulf War sought congressional approval before uh, taking action against Iraq when they invaded Kuwait with a, with a large uh, coalition, by the way, that supported the U.S. And then they, they crushed Iraq once, but they didn't go into Iraq and extract Saddam Hussein. But that was done again later uh, in 2003, again with the approval of, um, of uh, Congress uh, by uh, his son, uh, George, uh, George W. Bush. I'll put Bush Jr just to make it simple. Um, and they also obtained, uh, uh, Bush uh, Jr. also obtained permission in 2001 for uh, Afghanistan invasion of the war, war on terror. So Iraq too, when they actually went in and extracted Saddam Hussein, uh, and then uh, the first time the Persian Gulf War. Now there's a, there's a lot of controversy, especially on this one, and rightfully so, because this is predicated on false information and potentially corporate incentives. Uh, potentially this one as well, but certainly this one was much more controversial. In fact, there were some, there were some dishonesty from the uh, Bush administration. Um, but that one was, uh, the one in Afghanistan was more so of a unified joint response against the 9-11 attacks. Uh, and the, again, the uh, 1991 response was uh, generally 
viewed more positively because Iraq was uh, the aggressor in invading a neighboring nation of Kuwait. Um, so this war powers resolution has been ignored uh, several times, but it's also been, at least in spirit, followed several times. Uh, and that is, I think, just about all I wanted to say regarding the military, I think. Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say regarding that. Just, you want to know that it's, uh, it, it's run, uh, it's a civilian run military, with the head, of course, being the uh, um, president. Uh, he or she can, of course, act uh, on their own, act on own uh, in defense of nation, right, for invaded or immediate threat. They don't need any approval, and that is, uh, of course, uh, rebuffed and or, uh, doubled down on in the War Powers Resolution. Uh, but the issue is, can the president act otherwise without congressional approval? We have this War Powers Resolution, but it's been inconsistently followed uh, ever since 1973. And they did have some uh, uh, precedents for uh, wanting to uh, solidify Congress's position on on uh, being the chief party that, that would, would start or, or get the United States involved in a conflict. Mm -hmm.